recount the, the, the early growth of these, this church and maybe the near closing of the church, but how God blessed and uh, using you to plant other churches in the BCI family. I think that's just an encouragement to, to me uh, to be here today. So I'm very honored uh, to be here. As uh, was mentioned, I'm married. Uh, my, my wife is Mar Beth. We've been married 23 years, and uh, the Lord has blessed us with two wonderful children, uh, one through adoption and one uh, through biological birth. And uh, my daughter, Joy, is here today. So Joy's in the front. You can welcome her. Uh, very proud of her. She's a beautiful young lady, both inside and out. So we've enjoyed uh, our, our ride down today. In the busyness of life, we don't get that as often as we do. So it's great to spend time with you, Joy. Uh, before we get going, as mentioned, uh, I have a little booklet. It can be a ministry to you. Uh, Surviving the Storms of Life. I've given this out to people that are struggling, going through storms. And uh, it's a great, uh, for Christians, it's a great reminder of why God allows things to happen. And at the end, it's also a great challenge. There's an evangelistic thing at the end saying, hey, are you in the boat with Jesus? And if not, maybe God's using the storm uh, to get your attention. So it's a great resource. I'd recommend that to you there, and it's in the back. Also, I, I love sports. As Pastor Leposana mentioned, I'm the chaplain for hockey and a baseball team. And about a year and a half ago, I started a, a, a podcast called Post Game with uh, Paul Golden, and it's a, a sports and faith podcast where I interview different Christian athletes and coaches. Some are current players, some are retired players. I know this is the New York City area, so there's a few Yankees on there, including Andy Pettit. Uh, there's a Mets connection. There's a Pittsburgh Penguin. But I think you'll enjoy it, even if you don't like sports. We talk very little about their sport, but we talk a lot about their faith journey, what brought them to Christ, the adversities that they came through, what God's teaching them as a dad, as a grandfather. So I'd encourage you to check that out. It's on Apple and Spotify, but it's Post Game with Paul Golden. Also on the back table, there's a little, uh, I call it a card that you can check out, and it'll take you right to that, that site. It's an honor, as I said. I've been to the Philippines twice. First time ever I went on with a group uh, from our college, Clark Summit University, and it was during Christmas break. It was like December of 91 going into 92. So we're, we were in the Philippines about two and a half weeks, and we enjoyed New Year's over there in the Philippines. Actually, we were up in, I think it was Baguio City. And I'd never been experienced New Year's Eve in the Philippines before. Has anyone experienced that? <laughs> I thought we were under attack. I thought it was World War III. Man, fireworks and gunshots. We were, we were staying at the uh, Abwe, had the, the guest house. We thought we were under assault. Like, do we need to, like, hit the deck? But what a, great, what a great time in the city. I survived World War III. And I will say, I had been back before. We know several people. But uh, I love Jollibee, but I don't like Baloo. And I got nervous coming in today. I saw on the, with the bagels there were some eggs there. I'm like, that's not Baloo, is it? So fortunately, it was a hard-boiled egg, but on that first trip back in December, uh, you know, we traveled all day, actually two days, to get to the Philippines. We showed up at the guest house. I think it was late, and where we were staying, it was the Keswick Youth Conference during that holiday, the Christmas break, and there was two pastors, two young Filipinos, pastors in the Philippines that were there, Ulysses Marino, which some of you may know, and a guy named Jeremiah Lepasana. That was the first time I met Pastor Jerry. And it's neat how the Lord, over the years, I know he came to the States a few years later, uh, our, our paths would cross at Krispy Kreme. I should have brought a dozen donuts down for you, but uh, Krispy Kreme. And then also, just recently, uh, this summer, we, I got a, an email or a call from a pastor up in Syracuse, New York, by the name of Bruce Aubrey. And he said, hey, we want to use your facility, your conference room at Clark Summit University, because we're meeting with a pastor and another gentleman from New Jersey, and this was a good halfway point, and Pastor Bruce had never been to campus before, so I didn't even ask this, I didn't even think to ask, hey, who is this pastor? Lo and behold, in walks Jeremiah Lepasana and Irwin, I think who was here today, and it was great to get reconnected, we went out to a nice uh, Italian place for lunch, so it was just great to see how the Lord, you know, talk about the, the Bible talks about the Lord directs our steps, how the Lord has directed Pastor Lepasana to this ministry at BCI, and has grown it, built on the foundation of previous pastors to see how he's blessing here. But then to see my, my two trips to the Philippines and the, the connectedness to Pastor Jerry uh, to bring me today. So I, I'm truly humbled and honored to be part of your, your 40th uh, anniversary. So thank you for, for having me. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 8. We'll also have that on the screen in a moment. But I want to start with a sports story. And there's a picture we'll show you here. His name was Sam Marcinic. Just some background, you've probably never heard of this Yankee. 
Sam Marson, he grew up in Florida. He was a standout athlete at Jesuit High School in Tampa. He was a first-round draft pick for the MLB, which that's a, that's a significant achievement in and of itself. But it took him a long time to finally work his way up from the single A to double A to triple A, finally to New York. In fact, he spent nine long seasons in the minor leagues. And it was right before All-Star break, a sold-out Yankee Stadium, what, 45,000 people in the Bronx, beautiful Sunday afternoon game. And as a pitcher, he was in the bullpen, a relief pitcher. They were winning by a lot. They brought him in his very first time. He finally made it, right? He comes in, he pitches an inning and a third of relief. They win the game. Man, he finally made it to the top. His dream is fulfilled, right? Well, as I mentioned, this was in July, July 11th, right? That was the all-star break. A lot of sports take a break, so that following week, those few days, was a break. He was not an all-star, so he returned back to Florida, where he was excited and celebrated with his family, finally making it to the majors. Well, just two days later, he was out boating and wakeboarding with his buddies in Land Lakes, Florida, and uh, it was kind of a freak accident, but he blew out his knee wakeboarding. And he says, everything was falling into place, then all of a sudden it was over. He knew when he heard that pop that this is not good and this might jeopardize my career. Well, there's another significant event that took place not on a body of water in Florida, but on a body of water over in the beautiful land of Israel. And we have a picture there. It's actually this account in Matthew 8 is taken, uh, takes place in the upper part of Israel. If you've been to Israel, Israel is slightly larger than the state of New Jersey. And uh, no offense to New Jersey, it's slightly better maybe than New Jersey. Beautiful, beautiful country called the Holy Land. And uh, when we were there on a trip, we, we were up on Mar Arbel, overlooking this body of water, the Sea of Galilee. It's about 66 square miles uh, long and round. It's surrounded in some parts by high hills and narrow valleys. And sometimes they tell us when storms would come through, the combination, combina combination of the, the high hills and the valleys, the, the, the wind would hit that, and it would almost accelerate it. And then that wind would hit the surface level of the water, and it would cause significant storms that could come up very quickly and also could be very deadly. In fact, it re as recently as uh, March of 1992, 10-foot high waves were caused the modern-day city of Tiberias. So it's, it's where we find this type of storm and this exact body of water uh, with the, the disciples. Uh, back in 1986, there was a severe drought in the land of Israel. And along the seabed, along the, the lake of Sea of Galilee, the, obviously the water receded. And they found, some archaeologists found submerged and preserved in the lake bed was a, an old fishing boat. An old wooden boat was discovered, and there's a picture of that shortly. It's about 26 feet wide, or 26 feet long, 7 feet wide, and it would seat up to 15 men. Obviously, this is not the boat that Jesus was in, but it was, they dated it. This is, a, this is a common fishing vessel from Jesus' day. So as you, you should think about the Sea of Galilee, as you think about this boat, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 8 and see what takes place. Just some background on Matthew, I'm sure you know this from Pastor Lepasana's wonderful teaching, but the Gospels all have a certain focus, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew's focus to his Jewish readers was to prove to his readers that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. And, and Matthew records the major events in Jesus' life, in his ministry, as he fulfills uh, prophecy and shows that, hey, this is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And this account in Matthew 8 is one such account. So if you're there, Matthew 8 is also going to be on the, the, the screen. Matthew 8, 23, we find this. Verse 23, then Jesus, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. I love this contrast. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Next verse, he says, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Can you imagine that? It's kind of like the cool, calm dad. He's telling his kids in the backseat, hey, it's good. Why are you so afraid? Then Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. 
And the, 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 the word there in the original language is that it, it didn't just kind of slowly dissipate like a storm might roll in and then slowly dissipate. It's the idea of that word that it, it stopped immediately. The rain, the clouds, the waves, it immediately stopped, which is why in verse 27, the disciples, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They were flabbergasted. It's interesting to think, you know, some of those disciples in that boat were experienced fishermen, right? They no doubt had been on the Sea of Galilee and experienced storms like this. But apparently this one was the big one, right? That they were so afraid, they thought, you know, water's coming in the boat, it's tossing and turning, we're going to drown. It's at that point they are scared to death. And this, in all three accounts, this is recorded in Matthew 8, but Mark chapter 4 records this account. Also in Luke 8, the same storm. In all three events, all three accounts, Jesus rebukes his disciples for their fear and their lack of faith. And I think he's proving, right, as Matthew's writing to prove that he's Messiah, Jesus is once again in a very real, real, tangible way proving to his disciples that he is truly the Messiah, that he is, has power over nature and the elements itself. Well, that was a literal storm, right, the disciples went through, and we'll talk a little bit later about that. But you and I, right, are sooner or later in our lives going to go through figurative storms in our life right? We're either, we're either in one of three groups today. I can divide this up into a third, a third, or third, right? Either we're in the middle of a storm, either we're coming out of a storm, or storm clouds are brewing and we're about to go into a, a figurative storm, right? In Revelation 21, 4, as the writer of that passage talks about, no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, right? That's talking about the future. Well, that implies, right, that we're going to have those things while we're here, right? We are going to have pain. We are going to have sorrow. We are going to have death, mourning, and crying. So the implication is that we will experience sooner or later, and probably the older you are in life, you realize, yep, been, the, been through three major storms in my life, right? Cancer, death of a loved one, financial loss, unemployment, you name it. But sooner or later, we all will experience the storms of life. And today, my hope and my, my, my prayer is that through this, this study of this passage, that we'll, we'll have some, some ways to go through and how to deal with the storms of our life. So first one would be this. Why are the storms of life? God may be attempting to teach us something through a storm in our life, right? God may be attempting to teach you and I as we experience a storm in our life. Uh, I love Dr. Erwin Lutzer, uh, formerly of the Moody Church. He says this of uh, three reasons for storms, he says, to purge us, to perfect us, and to picture for us, right? You think about the life of Jonah, right? Jonah was disobeying God. He was literally running that direction when God said, go to Nineveh. And God literally brought the storm. We know the, the true account of him being swallowed up by a great fish. Another one is to perfect us, right? You think about Job, probably the most famous, wealthiest man of his day, and God allowed storms to happen, right? As, as the devil was testing him, to, to purge him, to prove that, yes, Job was trusting in God, not for what God did for him, but because he knew he was a true God. Then also to picture for us Jesus. As I mentioned, we, we talked about Sam Marsnick at the beginning. You know, why, did, man, you think about what a tragedy. Nine long years in the major, or in the minors to finally get to pitch in Yankee Stadium, and then his career is over. Well, a year and a half after that incident, as Sam was struggling to make sense of why would this happen, he was not a believer at the time, you know, why, why this? He got invited to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. It was kind of a baseball trip where they would go and do clinics in the morning with the kids in the, in the DR. They loved baseball. And then they would share Christ. Well, it was on that mission trip that Sam heard the gospel, probably for the first time, and realized his need for a Savior. He had, he had struggled with alcohol and with arrest. He would drink either until he passed out or until he ran out of money. Alcohol had, had, had become his addiction of choice. But yet getting saved, Sam grew and was discipled. He became a Christian school coach. He went on to get married to a lovely woman. They have four beautiful daughters. And now he runs 
a ministry in Jenna, Alabama called Baseball Country. And he uses baseball to bring these kids from all around the southeast U.S. and internationally to, to learn baseball skills, but really that's just a platform to share Christ. In fact, the motto of Baseball Country is using the greatest game ever played, baseball, to share the greatest story ever told, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you think about that storm in Sam's life. God used that storm, a career-ending career ending storm, blowing out his knee to finally break Sam and bring him to a saving knowledge of himself. Another idea of the storms of life, we may never understand the reason for a storm that God brings our way. But God does have a purpose. That's so reassuring. We, we may not know it. <laughs> he might not tell us. We might not, it might be years later that we can look back and say, ah, yeah, I could see how God used that storm to bring me to this place. But for some of us, we might not know until we get to heaven. Why did God allow that child to die? Why, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow that person to walk away from the marriage. We may never know, but God does have a purpose in the storm. I love Romans 8, 28, and I'll read it for you. It's not on the screen, but Romans 8, 28, the Apostle Paul reminds us kind of a perspective, perspective verses. It says this in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, right, smooth sailing days and the vicious storms of life, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. There's so many great truths in that scripture, but it's reminding us once again, hey, God uses all things, the storms of life, or the good times of life, to make us ultimately better for his good, or for our good and his glory. If you're familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata, she, as a teenager, dove into the uh, Potomac River, or the Chesapeake Bay, and came up basically a paraplegic as a teenager. And God's used her, quote-unquote, paralysis, her, her disability, for incredible good as a speaker, an author, just incredible insight. And she, she writes in her book that she co-wrote with a pastor, When God Weeps, she, she writes this as it relates to Romans 8, 28. She says, every trial in a Christian's life is ordained from eternity past, custom made for that believer's eternal good, even when it doesn't seem like it. Nothing happens by accident, not even tragedy, not even sins committed against us. Every sorrow we taste will one day prove to be the best possible thing that could have happened. We will thank God endlessly in heaven for the trials he sent us here. That's a great reminder from a woman who's had her share of storms. As mentioned, I love sports, and i chaplain for some sports teams. If you know anything about sports, there's a lot of sitting around and waiting. In, in hockey, if you're playing and you break a rule, an infraction, you have to sit out from playing. It's almost like a timeout for professional athletes, right? We call that the penalty box. Right? So if you have a penalty, you go off the ice and you sit in this, on this part of the bench called the penalty box. It might be two minutes, it might be four minutes, depending on a minor or major. You're being punished for what you did. In baseball, there's a place where the pitchers sit. If you're the starting pitcher for the day, right, you're starting, you're already on the mound, you're already playing. But there's maybe eight or ten guys that sit maybe way out over the outfield wall, and it's called the bullpen, and they sit and they sit, and they wait, and they wait, and they might not even get in that game. They might not pitch for two or three days. We call that the bullpen. And many times when God brings a storm in our life, we think, God, why are you punishing me? Why am I in this penalty box? When the reality sometimes is, hey, you're not in the penalty box. You're over here in the bullpen. And it might seem like you're being punished. You might seem like you're not being used. But God, I'm going to use you and bring you out at just the right time, at just the right moment. And I think it's important for us to remember, sometimes we think we're in the penalty box, but God may be just using us and waiting for that moment to God to use us. I don't have it, but if we were to come in today, is if I got here early enough and I hand out a 1,000-piece a, a puzzle, 
right? Jigsaw puzzle. How many people like jigsaw puzzles? Right? I don't because they're too, they're too tedious and I don't do well at them, right? But if I had a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and I handed each of you one or two pieces, right? Then I say, okay, take, it, take 30 minutes and everyone try to figure out. Let's try to figure out what this puzzle is about. You couldn't do it, right? Because we only have a couple pieces of the puzzle. And I love this statement. That my pastor said this a few years ago about storms. We can't judge the beauty of a puzzle by any single piece. Right? God, what are you doing? I'm, I'm only seeing two or three pieces of the puzzle here. Oh, there's only two or three more pieces here. I, I, I don't know what this picture is. I don't know what you're trying to do in this storm. And it doesn't make sense. I can't put it together. But as John Piper once said, he said this, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and we may be aware of only three of them, right? So when the storms of life come, you know, God, I don't, I don't know why you're allowing this to happen. I, I don't know why this addiction. I don't know why this broken relationship. I don't know why the cancer. I don't know why the Alzheimer's. I'm only getting a bit, bits and pieces of this puzzle. But I'm trusting you that you, <laughs> you see the big picture. And it might be a picture of a beautiful jigsaw puzzle of Yosemite Park or some beautiful thing, but only maybe until we get to heaven do we fully realize the scope of the beauty of the puzzle that he's creating. The next, next point is this. The difficult storms of life prepare you and I for future spiritual success. The storms of life that we're going through now could and most likely will prepare us for future successes. We were in Matthew 8. <clears throat> if you turn over just to chapter 10, I, I don't have the chronology, but I think Matthew 10 took place maybe just a few weeks or a month after the event at that night on the Sea of Galilee. And in Matthew 10, I won't read it, but Jesus calls his 12 disciples to him, and it says, I gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. Then it lists the 12 disciples, right? We know Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And it says this in verse 5, the 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, right? He says, don't, you know, go, he says go to the lost sheep of Israel. Or, do not go to law, the Gentiles or any other town, but go to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Uh, freely you have received, freely give. Now it's a different day and age, right? We don't at least I don't think so. Be shy, we don't believe in healing services. We don't believe in casting out demons. But at that moment, Jesus was giving his disciples in that time and that dispensation of, of, of Scripture, he's giving them the authority to say, listen, guys, the last two and a half years, you guys have been kind of following me, right? You've been my, my 12 guys on the front row. You've been watching me teach and preach and heal. But now I feel like you're ready, and I'm commissioning you to go out and do the exact same things that I've been doing. You're going to be teaching. You're going to be healing. You're going to be preaching. And it's almost like the apprenticeship is done, and now, guys, disciples, you're ready to go. And it's almost as if that storm a few weeks earlier, right, where they were all just dumbstruck or dumbfounded and awestruck that I know Jesus was awesome, but I had no idea that he could control the elements and silence the storm in an instant. Jesus is saying, hey, that same, that same power and authority that you saw demonstrated in me, I'm giving you that power and authority to go out and change the world. The storm prepared, I believe, the storm prepared the disciples to be sent out. They could have that confidence. Hey, if he's saying we got the same power that we saw firsthand, I believe him, let's go. It's almost as if he's saying, remember the boat, it stayed afloat, right? That's my golden, my last name's golden. I call it the golden paraphrase, right? It's almost as, as if he's saying in Matthew 10, listen, I brought you through that storm. That same power and authority that stopped the storm is the same power and authority I give to you. So remember the boat, it stayed afloat. Hey, can we re repeat that together? Just make sure you're staying awake with me. Re right? Remember the boat, it stayed afloat. Remember the boat, it stayed afloat. If you grew up here in the U.S. back several years ago, uh, you remember the Watergate scandal with uh, President Nixon. And uh, I know we just came through the midterms. I always, I, I, I jokingly say, I believe in uh, term, term limits, right? Every politician sh should serve one term in office and one term in prison. But that's, that's a joke. So. Hopefully there's no politicians here. I apologize in advance for offending you. 
But nothing's new under the sun, right? There's been corruption and uh, questionable stuff going on as long as we've been alive. If you remember the Watergate scandal, Richard Nixon was involved. One of his key men was a guy named Chuck Colson. And because of the Watergate scandal, he was imprisoned in 1973. Right? He was, he was inside the White House. He was a power broker. He was a big deal. But God broke him and used that imprisonment, though the shame of the Watergate scandal, to go to prison. While he was in prison, I think shortly before, he was given a copy of a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And while he was in prison, he read that book and came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. During that time in prison, he saw the need for the incarcerated, like, man, there's no gospel witness. We could do more. What happens when these guys get out? Helping them transition back, in, back to life. So as a result of Chuck Colson's imprisonment, he started a thing we call prison fellowship, right? I'm not sure if it's Angel Tree, every Christmas they take up, but it's the largest outreach to, to prison, prisoners, ex-prisoners, and their families, all because he himself, right, embroiled in the Watergate scandal, was in prison. And Chuck Colson, he died several years ago, but in his, uh, I think it was autobiography or his book, he said this about his storm. He said, my greatest humiliation, being sent to prison, was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. And we know, right, we know that, right? Shameful, downfall, Watergate scandal. But because of that storm, he becomes a follower of Christ. Because of that, he has a new, new purpose and reason for living. He sees the incredible need for the incarcerated, and he starts a prison fellowship, which still goes on today. They said the the difficult storms of life prepare you for future successes. Ultimately, storms are for our good and his glory, right? So how do we, right, so we kind of establish the fact, hey, sooner or later, as followers of Christ, we're going to go through storms, right? How, what's our perspective? How are we going to handle it? What's God going to use out of it? Well, here's a couple, I call it survival skills for surviving the storms of life. Uh, the first is this, God's presence is the secret to overcoming the fear of the storm. I think one of the, 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 the uh, songs we just sang talked about that, right? I think it's taken from Psalm 121, like, you know, wherever I go, you are there. I look to the heavens, you are there. Where can I look for your presence and protection? But it's a reminder to us that God's presence is the secret to overcoming the fear of the storm. I love this quote by uh, Raymond Edmond says this, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light, right? So what does that mean? As believers, right before the storm hits, we talk about storm preparedness, you know, we got to be in the Word, right, daily. We got to know what the Bible says. We got to know what God, we got to know, remind ourselves of the attributes and what's true about God. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful, omniscient. We got to have those truths ingrained in our, in our life so when the storms hit, We'll never doubt in the dark what God has told us in the light. Secondly, storms realign our priorities and give real perspective. Right? Isn't that true? We were, I was down at a conference down in Georgia this week. If you remember what happened, like the hurricane, I forget the hurricane, the hurricane was coming in to Florida. It went south of us, but we were getting on our phone like, you know, hurricane watch, tornado watch. High surf watch. I mean, I, I didn't know there's that many watches out there, but if you live in Florida, so I was kind of nervous, like, hey, this is a real storm. Like, should I be scared? Well, I talked to a few of the Floridians down there, like, ah, this is going to south of us. It's just going to be windy and rainy, and they were right, right? But suddenly, I got a little more focused, like, okay, what do I need to do if, the, if I can't get out of here? I need to make my plans to get to the airport, or what happens if the windows blow out? Do I need to be under the bed? Do I need... So suddenly... Right? Stop thinking about the conference and having a fun time. It's like, wait a second, I need to figure out. This storm hits. I can't get out of here. What, what am I going to do? And it re realigns our priorities, and it gives real perspective. Several years ago, in September of 2011, uh, my, my dad is a retired Baptist pastor, and he's living up in the Binghamton, New York area. And uh, there was a lot of rain in September and where they lived, the, the creek it way out back flooded, and they got about a foot and a half of water on their entire first floor. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? But a foot and a half of water, 
ruins all your furniture. You got to get is your carpet just a mess, right? Of course, they were they were crying. They were kind of overwhelmed. But my brother and I and several others came to help from the church. And before I know it, like, hey, my dad's perspective was, hey, it's just stuff. We need a new carpet. We didn't like that carpet anyways. Ah, we didn't like that. We didn't like that couch. We're going to get a new couch. And the perspective was like, man, what a great attitude. But it's because they had faith in Christ. They realized this stuff is just temporary. Fortunately, none of the sentimental stuff. I contrast that with them. Their, their neighbors immediately next door, not followers of Christ. They were devastated. They never rebuilt. They just, they just couldn't handle it. They were just so distraught, so hopeless. And I thought about that flood. Like, here's two people going through the exact same storm. The Christian has perspective. Hey, it's just stuff. Insurance will cover most of it. Got a new car out of it, new carpet, new TV, new stuff. Remount My mom wanted a new kitchen anyways. So many. What a great perspective. But yet the neighbors, they never re never came back to rebuild. They just deserted, just empty hopelessness. And you think about that, the storms realign, as a believer, realign our priorities and give us true perspective. I'm going to tell you about my friend. I went, As I said, I went to Clark Summit University, uh, and uh, while I was there, a senior, while I was a freshman, I really respected, super great guy. His name was Patrick McGoldrick. He was on the soccer team, Soccer team, became a successful youth pastor in Michigan and Kentucky, just well-loved, well-respected, just having a great ministry with teens. Well, about uh, 10 or so years ago, he was diagnosed, I think in his 40s, with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And if you don't think about ALS, it eventually shuts down your body. You, you die of suffocation because your muscles, you lose your muscle control. And I struggled with God, like, God, this guy is an awesome, not just a good past youth pastor, he is a great youth pastor, making an incredible difference, and yet he's struck with ALS. And this is a picture of him in his wheelchair shortly before he died. And shortly before he died, the church he was at outside of Detroit held kind of a final service for him. Not a memorial service, but we did songs. He preached his last message. And he had a strong voice when he was healthy, but his voice, you could barely, it was almost a whisper. And there was about 1,500 people in this large church, and we were hanging on every word of Patrick's last sermon. Not a dry eye in the place, right? Realizing that his end was near. And I remember him saying this, talking about, hey, I'm not bitter. Yeah, is he going to miss seeing his daughter get married? He's going to miss seeing his son graduate from seminary? Yeah, he's going to miss his wife. But true, just unbelievable God-inspired perspective. And he said these words, when he, based on 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this light and momentary affliction is compared to eternal glories. He said this, my shorter walk with Christ is infinitely greater than a longer road without Christ. He didn't get saved. He came from a crazy background from California. He didn't get saved until he was in high school. And his best friend, Matt Fry, led him to the Lord. They both came to college at Clarkson University. And the rest is history. But you think about Patrick's perspective. The storms realigned his priorities and gave him clear, super clear clarity on what truly matters. My shorter walk with Christ is infinitely greater than the longer road without Christ. Third and final point is this. As storms approach, choose to believe that the goodness of God is greater than the intensity of the storm. I got that quote from uh, Dr. David Jeremiah several years ago. I read it, one of his devotionals, but I just thought it just struck me. We have a choice to make, right? When these things happen, we can, get, we can get angry with God. We could walk away from our faith. We become bitter, depressed, discouraged, angry at God. Or we can make a deliberate choice and say, you know what? Despite my circumstances, despite this storm I'm going through right now, I am going to make an intentional choice to trust in God and his goodness as a father that is greater than it, the storm clouds and the water surrounding me. We, we mentioned Job earlier in, in Job 2, verses 9 and 10. You remember his wife, I think she was a godly wife and meant well, but she was just kind of like, you know what, Job, all we've been through, losing all of our kids, our wealth, and we're in this physically incredibly dark place. Just curse God and die. He says this, right? Verse 9, his wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. 
Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. Shall we accept the good from God and not trouble when they come? Picking up on that Sam Marsnick story, right? He blows out his knee. His career is over. A year and a half later, he comes to faith in Christ because of that. He grows in faith. He's having an outstanding ministry. Well, just a few years ago, I was down in Florida for spring training, and the place I was staying with, he was a retired scout uh, with the, the New York Mets and the Yankees, and he knew, he remembered Sam as a high school kid, right, this high school phenom, and Les is the believer, and he's like, you know, we're talking about Sam and kind of what he's doing now, just like, isn't that awesome how God used that? And Les Parker had this great quote. He said, God sure knew what he was doing when he took baseball away from Sam, right? And it just struck me, like, you know what? God sure knows what it does. God sure does know what he's doing when storms of life happen. Of course, at the time, Sam didn't think it was a good thing. Les didn't think it was a good thing. But with time and distance, you look back and say, oh, yeah, I can see how God used that in his life. I guess my challenge to you is God sure knows what he's doing in your life when the storms of life come. I'll close with a story. Several years ago on our 10th wedding anniversary, my wife and I uh, love California, so we went up to uh, central or northern California. We flew into San Francisco, saw, you know, did all those things, Alcatraz and uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and all that, but we were very much excited to go to Yosemite National Park. Has anyone ever been up to Yosemite, Mariposa Grove? It's just a beautiful place of creation, right? As we're there, we're walking through the Mariposa Grove and these, these gigantic sequoia trees, just massive trees. You can see the person at the base, just been there 2,000 years. These trees are just giants compared to trees around here. And we're just awestruck by God's beauty and how small we are and how beautiful his creation is. As we left that day, I grabbed a, a National Park Service brochure, just kind of look at it back in the hotel. And we got back that night, I looked in the hotel, and they're in the hotel room, we're looking through the brochure, just for some history, and I, I came across some explanation about these famous trees. It says this, the sequoia groves, or the giant sequoias dwarf even the largest pine trees that live among them. They are descendants of the ancient line of trees that can live for over 2,000 years. Their trunks can reach over 25 feet feet thick. As symbols of their longevity and strength, the giant sequoias played a major role in the creation of what is now Yosemite National Park. President Abraham Lincoln signed the bill that set aside the Mariposa Grove along with Yosemite Valley in 1864. In the years following his action, a fire started, following, a fire started in the grove, and we began a hundred-year history of protecting these beloved trees from fire. Get this. While our intentions were good, we were contributing to the loss of what we cared about so much. Through research and experimentation, we discovered that fire actually promotes reproduction of these giant trees. It clears away the competing firs and cedars and exposes bare mineral soil for the tiny seeds to take root. The storms of life, at the time, we're like, oh, this is the worst thing to happen. A fire in the sequoia grove, this diagnosis, this terrible news, a personal storm, a family storm, whatever it may be, but I challenge you to remember the boat, it stayed the float, right? God is going to use that storm that you are going through now or will go through for our good and his glory. Will you bow with me in prayer as we close?